Hello, I'm Phil Mullen, psychotherapist, and I'm going to talk about when psychotherapy is harmful. Uh, this is based on, this is a shortened version of uh, what I presented in one day workshops uh, a few years back. Uh, it's not always a, a, a popular topic, but I think it is a very important one. Now, first of all, I want to emphasize as a sort of meta statement around all of this, all of what I'm saying is that I do think that psychotherapy can be very helpful uh, to many people often. Uh, but sometimes, uh, sometimes it's not helpful, sometimes it's even harmful. And uh, that's what I'm going to speak about here. So now I'm just going to um, uh, sh share my screen here to show some uh, slides um, uh, just to illustrate the points I'm going to make, if you just uh, bear with me. I'm just waiting for the slides to open here. Okay, so let's start showing these PowerPoint slides. There we go. Okay. So when psychotherapy is harmful. Okay, so here, here's some of the th points I'm going to address. Um, research indicates that psychotherapy is often not very effective in alleviating people's problems and can sometimes leave people in a worse state. Uh, second point, the legitimate goals of psychotherapy, in my view, are to do with reducing a person's internal obstacles to work and love. But some goals of psychotherapy uh, seem less legitimate and may imp implicitly promise illusions. Uh, one of my themes that I won't dwell on so much here, but um, I have written about it, uh, the excessive pursuit of transference or excessive privileging of the relationship, the therapeutic relationship, can, in my view, be unhelpful. And it seems to me that the original sensible and simple mode of therapy developed by Sigmund Freud has become perverted in a variety of ways. I also want to mention that uh, EMDR, eye movement desensitization and reprocessing, offers an illustrative model of therapy that contrasts with many more traditional forms and styles of psychotherapy, and it does have something to teach us. I'll also mention how ADHD, Attention Deficit Hyperactivity Disorder, provides an illustration of impaired ego functions, impaired relationships to reality. I'm going to also speak about the ethics of listening. Uh, so here are some bad experiences I've heard about, and uh, this is over a long period of time. I've been in clinical practice over 45 years. So uh, a patient sees an analyst for 30 years, but the problems are unresolved. Uh, a patient is in a long analysis, but does not feel that he or she is improving, but the analyst discourages them from leaving, pointing out how many problems are unresolved and arguing that ending would be a defensive escape. Or a patient experiences the analyst as constantly belittling them. Now, self-esteem is eroded, but they feel unable to leave. A patient is told that the only approach that will help them is a, a long analysis over many years, five times a week. Oh, that slide should not be... Oh, dear, what's happened here? Um, the, um, Try and go back to the beginning if I can. What else happening here? Okay. Uh, 
Um, yeah. Um, in an assessment meeting was many years ago, uh, a woman patient was from South America was described. She was distressed about her brother, who was one of the disappeared. Uh, as you may know, uh, the military rulers engaged in aggressive repression of uh, protesters and dissidents uh, simply disappeared. Um, the senior analyst in this meeting remarked that this woman's problems were to do with her own projected aggression. Uh, another instance, uh, th those occasions when the psychoanalytic work dwells exclusively on the supposed unconscious relationship of the patient to the analyst and any reference to external events or to the historical past are taken as metaphorical speech relating to the present interaction. Other instances, the analytic work continues for years, but crucial early traumatic experiences are never addressed. Or early trauma is addressed continually with the result that the patient becomes increasingly depressed and re-traumatized. Uh, so there, there are many ways in which um, uh, psychoanalytically informed therapy uh, can go wrong, as well as its potential to be very, very helpful. Um, other experiences, an NHS patient with severe regional pain syndrome, which is a, a terrible degenerative condition triggered by an injury, uh, was told that she would soon be better if she has uh, cognitive behavior therapy, CBT. Absurd. Uh, a, or a patient is told that CBT will cure her anxiety, and when it does not, she experiences even more panic. A traumatized patient is taught anxiety management techniques by her CBT therapist, but the trauma itself is not addressed. An NHS trust pays a large amount of money for a patient with chronic obsessive compulsive disorder to attend a prestigious inpatient unit specializing in these problems using CBT methods. Whilst there, the patient makes some improvement. After discharge, she gradually returns to her previous level of functioning. A patient is referred for psychotherapy because of unexplained medical symptoms, that catch-all phrase that's uh, commonly used, uh, and it's usually used with an implication that the person making that diagnosis thinks the problems are somehow of a psychological nature. So a patient is re referred for psychotherapy because of unexplained medical symptoms, but in reality, that person has uh, a serious disease such as uh, Lyme disease or Ehlers-Danlos syndrome, hypermobility, both of which can give rise to uh, um, a whole range, multiple uh, physical and psychological difficulties. Or a patient undergoes years of psychotherapy without the therapist being aware or understanding that the client has ADHD or autistic spectrum conditions. And uh, here's a quote from an article in the Australian and New Zealand Journal of Psychiatry. The longer any patient attends a psychotherapist, irrespective of, of how therapeutic the therapy, the patient risks contracting their independent capacity to make decisions, whether by deferring in sessions to their therapist or by filtering decisions outside therapy through the therapist decision-making model. The risk is for the patient to remain in a therapeutically shaped comfort zone, distant 
distanced from the capacity and risks inherent in making their own mistakes in the real world and more importantly learning from them and so shifting their interpersonal investments uh, to uh, so as to limit uh, primary and extended relationships Uh, this is a, a historical example, um, uh, a, a physician by the name of uh, Dr. Osharov was admitted to uh, the famous Chestnut Lodge American Hospital with symptoms of uh, psychosis uh, and, and depression and received uh, near daily uh, intensive psychotherapy over seven months. Uh, but was not given medication. Subsequently, he was referred to another hospital and recovered soon after receiving uh, psychotropic medication. But during this time at the, at the Chestnut Lodge, his wife had left him. He'd lost his uh, hospital accreditation as a, as a doctor and uh, uh, his medical practice. Uh, partner had um, ousted him. And Dr. Osharov sued the hospital for malpractice on the grounds that he should have received medications of de demonstrated efficacy rather than intensive psychotherapy. Uh, it's a historical example, but um, uh, uh, there are important points in that. Uh, now, there are dangers inherent in uh, forms of psychotherapy that evoke high levels of emotional arousal. So it's been suggested that uh, therapeutic work that induces high emotional arousal may inadvertently cause an increase in alcohol consumption. Uh, especially in those with uh, comorbid uh, mood disorders. Uh, so the, the person turns to um, alcohol or other drugs, whatever they use to try to um, um, manage their emotions in a, obviously a maladaptive way of managing, but if that's what the person does, then therapy that provokes high emotions may exacerbate those maladaptive coping strategies of alcohol or illicit drugs. Also, uh, interventions that risk increasing a person's feeling of being stigmatized or where they feel blamed for not meeting intervention targets have been found to increase feelings of helplessness and self-blame and in that way undermine uh, a sense of self-efficacy. Um, further hazards of uh, CBT, uh, it assumes, this approach assumes that the individual has an ongoing cognitive schema that causes them to view themselves, the world and their future with negative ascriptions. Therapy is designed to challenge their cognitive assumptions and encourage behavioral repertoires, generating more positive outcomes. Now, the focus on rational thinking assumes a certain level of reasoning capacity, which may be lacking uh, in, in some people due to uh, uh, lower intelligence or lacking due to their uh, current symptoms that are uh, preventing them uh, thinking clearly. So some patients confronted with such expectations and unable to meet them, um, particularly if it's a consequence of severe depression, may have their sense of self-worth further undermined. CBT shifts responsibility onto the individual for active engagement and conduct of the techniques so that a recipient of this may feel guilty if the treatment does not result in the expected improvements without realizing that 
there are many other factors that may uh, affect the uh, response. Uh, so it's also been noted that high session frequency and also long length of treatment can make the dangers of dependency particularly uh, salient. And the, the problem is that uh, long-term psychotherapy can meet multiple emotional needs so that life outside therapy is neglected can result in a decreased capacity for independent judgment. Um, um, yes, I won't go uh, uh, through the rest of those. Uh, th those are uh, some quotes actually from um, um, from the paper on um, uh, when interventions harm. Okay. Uh, adverse therapeutic styles. Uh, uh, this was a paper published in 2013. Uh, there are four adverse therapeutic styles. Uh, this is based on responses to uh, questionnaire responses to uh, uh, from 700 respondents. Uh, adverse therapeutic style number one uh, is a lack of empathy or respect, not having the patient's interests at heart. Uh, the second is the therapist is preoccupied and makes the patient feel alienated and powerful, seems unengaged. Third one is a, a rather controlling kind of therapist who encourages dependence. The fourth is a, a passive therapist who's, or who seems inexperienced, inactive, or somehow lacked credibility. Now, if we go back to uh, Freud uh, and uh, almost all of what Freud wrote was very uh, thoughtful and um, actually rather sensible. He's often misrepresented. Um, so Freud wrote an important paper that his final paper, actually his final book, uh, an outline of psychoanalysis, uh, summarizing what psychoanalysis should be about. And this is what he wrote, that uh, the, the, the work you see is to do, or should be to do with supporting the functions of the ego, supporting the ego in doing a better job of mediating between what is inside and the external world. That's what the ego is uh, all about. So Freud wrote, an action by the ego is as it should be if it satisfies simultaneously the demands of the id, uh, that's the, the inner um, needs and uh, impulses, uh, the demands of the superego, uh, the um, uh, voice of uh, values, the um, uh, self-critical function, um, uh, the voice of uh, guilt, and of uh, shame. Uh, where our, our, our values, our, our conscience uh, is located. And thirdly, satisfying the demands of external reality. That is to say, if it is able to reconcile their demands with one another. Uh, the details of the relationship between the ego and the superego become completely intelligible when they are traced back to the child's attitudes to its parents. This parental influence includes not only the personalities of the actual parents, but also the family, 
uh, racial and national traditions handed on through them, as well as the demands of the immediate social milieu uh, which they represent. The superego receives contributions from later successors and substitutes of his parents, such as teachers and models in public life of admired social ideals. So he's describing there the way in which uh, the values of the family and the wider society are uh, in, internalized and um, continue their effect um, autonomously in, in, internally. And the ego has to take account of uh, this system of internal rules and uh, uh, values, morality, uh, um, juxtaposing it to uh, the inner emotional needs and impulses, and also uh, the demands and requirements of the external world. Um, now, I just mentioned ADHD here because it's, it's an interesting um, uh, condition. Uh, it's a neurobiological, uh, neurobiologically based uh, condition, which interacts with the environment to create uh, quite complex constellations. But the, uh, the neurobiological temperament in ADHD tends to be one in which uh, reality, the demands of reality and frustrations are rejected uh, the ADHD temperament is a big no, it's a sort of big scream of no. And uh, what is privileged is the uh, pursuit of pleasure and instant gratification. And uh, it can also display unrestrained narcissism and egocentricity. Uh, and in such work, it seems to be the therapist's task really is to try to support the, the person's ego functions and help them to uh, negotiate reality, come to terms with reality and to delay gratification and, and work towards long-term goals to, to support the person, the person's ego in, in so doing. And some people do require long-term ego support of that nature. And that can be one situation in which uh, uh, long-term uh, supportive psychotherapy uh, can be quite appropriate. Um, let's just go back for a moment to uh, Freud, 1940. Um, here's what he uh, describes as the uh, therapeutic task. The ego is weakened by the internal conflict and we must go to its help. The position is like that in a civil war, which has to be decided by the assistance of an ally from outside. Note the, uh, the metaphor there, the, the, the psyche is like a condition of civil war. The analytic physician and the patient's weakened ego, basing themselves on the real external world, have to band themselves together into a party against the enemies, the instinct instinctual demands of the id and the conscientious demands of the superego. We form a pact with each other. The sick ego promises us the most complete candor, promises to put at our disposal all the material which its self-perception yields. We assure the patient of the strictest discretion and place at his service our experience in interpreting material that has been influenced by the unconscious. Our knowledge is to make up for his ignorance and to give his ego back its mastery over the lost promise provinces of his mental life. This pact constitutes the analytic situation. I think that essentially is a, a very good and sensible uh, account of things. But if we look at psychotherapy as a whole, 
the truth is that it's sometimes not very effective. These are observations uh, noted in uh, Bruce Wampo's uh, book on psychotherapy research, The Great Psychotherapy Debate. Uh, so we can say that best results from research suggest that around 60% of clients benefit. That means quite a lot do not benefit. And about 8% of adults, adults deteriorate during psychotherapy. And it was found that 15 to 24% of adolescents leave therapy in a worse state than when they started. Uh, if we look at the, um, um, the much hyped um, NHS uh, Improving Access to Psychological Therapies program, IACT program, uh, which started a few years back, um, uh, the initial research on that, uh, th this figure isn't publicized, but uh, there it is in the research, that only 6% of people referred to the IAPT program recovered. 6% six, 6 of those referred to it. Now, on the other hand, 43% of those who completed treatment recovered. So of those who stuck it out, 43% recovered, but a lot did not stick with it. Now, the most, cons the most consistent finding in psychotherapy research is that when genuine psychotherapies are compared, there is very little difference in outcome. Uh, that is very important. When genuine therapies are compared, they're all more or less similarly uh, effective or ineffective. And there is much more difference in effectiveness between therapists than between therapies. So some psychotherapists seem to be helpful and effective, and some psychotherapists appear to be less so. And it doesn't really have much to do with their overall therapeutic uh, theory or, or allegiance or um, the model they're using. Uh, Michael Lampart, Lambert um, uh, found that 90% uh, of psychotherapists think that their treatment outcomes are better than those of their peers. So obviously they can't be right. Um, he asked 40 therapists, uh, 20 of whom were qualified and 20 were trainees to identify patients in their caseload who were deteriorating and might leave therapy worse off. Now the researchers identified 40 out of a sample of 350 patients using objective measures, uh, but only one therapist who was actually a trainee uh, was able to identify uh, one of these, uh, one of these 40. The qualified therapist did not identify a single case. So Lambert concluded that uh, psychodynamic therapists in particular are usually overconfident in their clinical judgment. So that's quite a shocking uh, observation. Um, a book by psychoanalyst Al Goberg, The Analysis of Failure, noted that uh, analysts tend to, um, as he wrote, do what we do and explain both success and failure on the basis of the theoretical approach that is most congenial to us. Perhaps that is a mistake. We do what we do, and we regularly and sometimes persistently keep on doing it. 
Sometimes it works and sometimes we lose patience, he wrote. Um, a psychoanalyst, one of, one of the analysts uh, I've most admired and has been most influential um, on me has been uh, Heinz Kohut. And uh, uh, this was in his last book, um, a final book, um, 1981, I think. Uh, in the largest number of instances, a future analyst training commits him to a particular set of theoretical beliefs. With very rare excep exceptions, the analyst does not stray from these beliefs, which he comes to make his own. Rather, he defends them loyally, displaying hostility and contempt towards those who do not share them. I do not believe that groups whose members display such deep and unswerving loyalty to specific sets of theories are encountered with equal frequency in other sciences. Uh, uh, a psychologist called uh, uh, Lilienfeld identified uh, potential, potentially harmful therapists um, so, first of all, he found that in a survey of 12, uh, amongst 12 leading psychotherapy outcome researchers, he found agreement that about 10% of clients overall deteriorate during therapy. They may show, show symptom worsening or new symptoms. They may show excessive dependence on the therapist. There may be harm of some kind to family members, uh, like psychological harm to family members. There may be a reluctance to seek uh, other forms of treatment. There's also the opportunity costs, as it's called, uh, when a person does not seek more effective treatment. So there are lost opportunities for more effective uh, help. And uh, Scott Lilienfeld identified um, uh, the following potentially harmful therapies. Uh, critical incident stress debriefing. So uh, uh, too much talking about uh, a, sh a shocking incident soon after it's happened. Um, something called scared straight programs for young offenders, grief counselling for normal bereavement reactions. So normal bereavement does not need counselling. If it's a stuck bereavement, the person is not, uh, is not in any way coming to terms with their loss, um, after uh, a reasonable time, then uh, therapeutic assistance may be indicated. Boot camp interventions for conduct disorder. Certain kinds of drug abuse programs. And therapies focused on identifying early trauma. Now, a key feature in all of these is that they can involve exposure to intense emotion that the person may have difficulty in managing. Um, an article in the American Psychologist, 2010. However painful it may be, it is important for those of us who are psychotherapists to recognize that we have all likely harmed one or more of our clients. We would venture to guess that all experienced psychotherapists have at one point or another in their careers, fail to meet the most basic and ethically important principle guiding the profession. First, do no harm. Now, here's what I think are legitimate goals of psychotherapy. To help the client resolve internal obstacles to achieving goals and satisfying desires in, in relationships and in work and supporting Freud's view of mental health 
as the capacity to love and to work and to help counter unrealistic illusions about life, including illusions regarding psychotherapy, and to facilitate the shift from what Freud called neurotic misery to ordinary unhappiness. And there are three interrelated forms of internal obstacles uh, to achieving uh, those legitimate goals. So one is there is psychodynamic conflict. The mind is in conflict and unable to function optimally. Uh, secondly, there is trauma. The person has been overwhelmed with trauma. Uh, so both of those uh, require psychotherapeutic assistance. And the third, uh, there is impaired ego functions insufficient dominance of the reality principles, as in the example I gave earlier of attention deficit hyperactivity disorder. Now, here are some goals that I think are, um, they're not always explicit, but they are quite widespread implicitly. And I would suggest they are not legitimate. They, they cannot be satisfied and they are um, unhealthy. So the first is offering formulas for illusory happiness, promising this, promising that. If you follow this program, uh, life will be wonderful. Or persuading the client to adopt the therapist's worldview and values and life strategies. That's not a good idea. Reparenting, uh, the attempt to create secure attachment or other attempts to provide reparative experiences that are intended to compensate for traumas and deficiencies in childhood. Uh, the problem is it doesn't work, it can't be done, and it causes harm to try to do that. Uh, another illegitimate uh, stance is where the therapist is seen as the one who knows, the analyst as the expert on life. Uh, but uh, no analyst or psychotherapist is really in possession of special insights or knowledge concerning the secrets of life. So when psychotherapy loses its legitimate purpose, what happens? Well, there can be a waste of years of life and money, of course. Uh, the endless pursuit of the transference, so-called. Uh, there, there, there is a thing called transference, but the, the idea is often um, inappropriately broadened to include um, uh, everything that's going on between um, uh, client and therapist, and the, uh, the endless pursuit of this becomes a wild goose chase. Uh, it becomes a collusion where the, uh, the therapist gets a regular income and the client gets to postpone reality. So it is important to accept A, when therapy is not working, or B, when therapist and client have done as much as they can do. Uh, dangers of long-term psychotherapy is, is that it becomes a substitute for real life and a massive drain of financial and psychological resources. The so-called transference neurosis is never resolved. The client keeps hoping that the conflictual relationship with the therapist will be put right. It never is. Uh, an excessive focus on transference, particularly negative transference entrenches the client in a narcissistically wounding relationship that is pervaded with hostility and the aggressive drive then is constantly provoked. If there is an absence of uh, childhood historical and developmental context then this can trap the client in a conflictual dyad uh, uh, with the therapist that is experienced as real 
uh, when really it's um, uh, a kind of transference illusion. And it's the historical developmental context exploring what went on originally that is able to reveal the transference as an illusion, as a repeat. As Freud put it, as um, uh, a memory that is uh, experienced in an illusory way as uh, happening in the present. That's what Freud said transference is, and I think Freud was absolutely correct. So there is this big illusion, uh, an implicit idea that's become prevalent in our culture, that the psychotherapeutic relationship can somehow make up for or repair what went wrong or was missing in childhood. And it's fostered by a prevalent emphasis on the crucial role of the therapeutic relationship. Uh, uh, too much emphasis. Um, and it, that can take the form either of um, uh, constantly um, uh, here and now talk of transference, what's going on now, or in uh, relational forms of therapy and relational uh, psychoanalysis, uh, sometimes in attachment-based psychotherapy and in Rogerian counselling or focused on the here and now relationship. It's a dangerous illusion, likely to lead to malignant regression and the toxic transference relationship pervaded by intense need, rage and ultimate disillusionment over wasted years. Uh, there was a study of clients who terminated therapy early and, and a, a content analysis of the final session. Uh, there were too many transference interpretations. Uh, the client's ex expression of frustration with the therapy were interpreted as uh, uh, transference and it, it was a power struggle marked by the therapists being sharp, blunt, sarcastic, insistent, impatient, or condescending. Um, there was a book by, uh, uh, I'm not sure how you pronounce this, uh, Dorte von Drigalski, uh, uh, published in uh, Germany. Um, I think it was published in the um, 1980s about her account of uh, psychoanalysis. It's um, uh, quite a troubling, a troubling uh, read. I won't go through all of that. Um, um, uh, but she um, uh, she came to feel that uh, psychoanalysis, as she experienced it, and as practice in the uh, um, location she was in, uh, was. Uh, often harmful. Um, does more harm than good, she concluded. Um, now, I, I, as I must emphasize again, I, I don't think that's the case with all forms of psychotherapy and psychoanalysis. Often these are very helpful, but there's always the potential for them to veer off in some unfortunate direction. Um, so things, things can become um, harmful in uh, these ways. If, if there's a lot of hurtful interpretations, aggressively imposing a theory, being in disparaging of other uh, therapeutic theories, um, charging very high fees that are inappropriate for the, the client, uh, letting the person spend a very high proportion of their income uh, on the therapy, um, coercing the client to have more and more uh, sessions per week. Um, um, I, I won't go through um, all of these. I won't go through all of these. Uh, I'd like to just mention this uh, uh, a, a related point about harm. Uh, 
and it's the harm of diagnostic labels. Uh, now, these days, the, the um, uh, and I, I'm speaking of when I used to work in the NHS, I haven't worked in the NHS for uh, some years uh, now, but uh, the commercially organized nature of the NHS requires all patients be given a diagnosis. Um, when I say commercially organized, it means that uh, data has to be provided on um, the kind of patient's diagnosis and the form of treatment offered and so on. And this all, all computerized data is used to determine um, uh, who is being paid what for whom, which, which, which organization is being um, paid uh, how much. It's all to do with the internal marketplace of, of the NHS. So diagnosis has commercial implications. So the worse the diagnosis, the, uh, the, the more money the, um, uh, the organization uh, would receive for that patient's care. But the diagnosis appears on all letters. Um, and the problem then, so the, and these letters are sent to the client. That's another routine thing. When a doctor or anyone uh, in the NHS writes a letter to another professional person about the patient, the patient is sent a copy. So the, the problem is then that the client is often inclined to identify with the diagnosis. So they, they read on the, uh, on the letter, diagnosis, um, borderline personality disorder, or whatever, the emotionally unstable personality disorder, or whatever. And then they identify with that diagnosis and it alienates the person from their own lived experience. It becomes another kind of uh, false self and becomes a part of a, a hall of mirrors, uh, reflecting uh, images from outside that um, really take the person away from their inner experience. Um, Bernard Schwartz and John Flowers uh, wrote a book, How to Fail as a Therapist, 50 Ways to Lose or Damage Your Patients. Uh, I won't go uh, through all of that. Let's take a contrasting uh, uh, contemporary model of therapy, um, which is uh, often uh, uh, quite helpful for many, many people, particularly where there has been trauma. Uh, and it's interesting what it reveals, eye movement, desensitization and reprocessing. So it involves um, having the client focus on uh, traumatic experiences or other emotional uh, difficulties, other contents of the mind, whilst making uh, either side-to-side -side eye movements or other forms of bilateral stimulation. So it can be uh, headphones that go boop, 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 either ear alternately or tapping alternately either side of the body, or things you hold that vibrate in one hand, boop, 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 boop. So it stimulates one side of the body in one, one hemisphere than the, than the other. And it's often extremely effective in processing emotion and allowing the person to, be, to become free of the traumas of the past. And it has a very internal focus. So it doesn't depend on the therapist uh, making clever remarks, clever interpretations. Uh, it doesn't uh, depend on the therapeutic relationship. The relationship just has to be uh, good enough to allow the process to take place. Uh, transference, so the intrusion of the past into the present in a, a misperception of the current relationship, it may occur occasionally, but it's rarely um, all that relevant in uh, EMDR work. Uh, most of the therapist's comments in the work would just be along the lines of, just notice that, 
or just go with that. So asking the asking the client, the patient, what what comes to mind, what they observe in the in uh, as going through the process, and the therapist just says, okay, just notice that, and or just go with that, and on with the bilateral stimulation. So it's an interesting um, uh, illustration of um, uh, ways of working that are, uh, that are rather um, different from, um, and, and which call into question many uh, um, prevalent assumptions in uh, more conventional uh, talking therapy. Of course, the term talking therapy is, is a bit of a misnomer risk because um, it's actually, uh, when it goes well, it's a, a listening therapy. The listening is the more important than the talking. The listening determines uh, uh, the talking, certainly from the position of, of the therapist. The therapist listens, facilitates the client's talking. Um, Yes. Uh, a nice quote from Nina Coltart, uh, psycho, uh, eminent psychoanalyst, uh, drawing on uh, uh, Buddh Buddhism. The more one just attends and the less one actually thinks during an analytic session, the more open one is to learning to trust the intuition which arises from the less rational and cognitive parts of the self, and the more open one is also to a full and direct apprehension of the patient and of what is actually going on. Um, so this stance of not presuming to know, um, the, the capacity that uh, the poet John Keats called negative capability, and uh, uh, this um, concept and this stance described by John Keats is um, deeply embraced by many uh, uh, psychoanalysts, and I think it is very important. He wrote, several things dovetailed in my mind, and at once it struck me what quality went to form a man of achievement, especially in literature, and which Shakespeare possessed so enormously. I mean negative capability. That is, when a man is capable of being in uncertainties, mysteries, doubts, without any irritable reaching after fact and reason. So it's often what, what the analyst or therapist does not do that is most important, does not presume to know and does not try to fit the patient into a theory or dogma, and does not assume the position of authority. Of course, this negative capability must be balanced with active inquiry and appropriate expressions of concern. Uh, I won't go into this point that, um, uh, except just to say that um, any kind of change can be destabilizing and can evoke uh, what Heinz Kohut called disintegration, disintegration anxiety. And it perhaps does create a natural speed limit to psychological change, just uh, as there is with uh, biological uh, change. Uh, so sometimes we have to uh, go uh, slowly because too much progress, even if seemingly positive, uh, can be highly alarming. Uh, so what are the ways to minimize the risk of harm in psychotherapy uh, for, the, for the psychotherapist's uh, position? Well, to continually, continually seek feedback. Uh, from the client, is this helping? Uh, to have a regular review, if there's, um, if it's long-term work, to have a kind of annual review, 
uh, where have we gone to? Um, is what we're doing helpful? What more is there to address? Uh, clarify goals. Therapy should not be an end in itself. It should not be a substitute for uh, life. It can be important to frame problems in terms of positive goals. Where does the person want to get to? Uh, is that realistic? And what obstacles might there be to achieving that goal? We have to balance exploration of the traumatic past with an intention for a positive future and to explore what obstacles there might be to this positive future. Any form of impasse or lack of progress is a signal to step back and consider what is going wrong. And for both uh, therapist and client to address that question, what's going wrong or what is preventing us making more progress together? Uh, avoid illusions of knowing. Uh, not being caught up in the archetype of the, the wise one who knows. And to recognize that all interpretations or understandings are in error. Uh, all of them. Uh, they may have a partial truth from one perspective, but they're, they're never going to be the, the whole truth. And if, as a psychotherapist, if you repeat a previous interpretation, a previous formulation that has seemed relevant before, then you're probably coming up with it defensively. It's no longer alive and fresh and spontaneous in the moment. It is, of course, important to stay within one's scope of practice, which means not making pronouncements about the patient's life. Uh, the therapist's basic task is to receive and expand on what the client is communicating. Uh, there's what I call the uh, linguistic code to unlock higher dimensional guidance or intuition. It's a sort of internal prayer, which is to uh, think first inwardly, I'm in error. I'm sorry, I ask forgiveness, I seek guidance and truth. A useful question to put to the client is, if something was stopping you from getting better, what would you guess it might be? What comes to mind? And uh, often the, the person is uh, very able to then state exactly what it is. And to convey that it is the client's deeper mind that knows what needs to be addressed. And here's the crucial subtle thing, that the real therapeutic skill is in allowing oneself to be guided by the client and by the client's deeper system. If you like, that the work is supervised by the client's deeper wisdom, not the client's uh, superficial conscious mind, but the client's deeper wisdom, the unconscious wisdom. And uh, the ethics of listening. This is perhaps the, the important, most important um, slide at the end here, that the client is a sacred other. That's the stance that I uh, always try to assume. At, and that at their core, this other is essentially unknown and unknowable. But if we listen without judgment and without a clamor to impose our understanding, this sacred other may reveal something of who they are. The precise words used by the other are important. We should not distort them by substituting our own words. We should take care that our own take care that our own words in response have coherence and clarity, not to add confusion to the client's discourse. 
new understanding will emerge in the client's free associative discourse, not through the analyst or therapist showing him or her what is unconsciously going on. The understanding will just emerge spontaneously. To disregard what the client consciously means and to transpose this as an unconscious narrative about the here and now relationship is a potentially harmful invalidation of the client's subjectivity. And similarly, to seek to understand the client without consideration of the historical childhood past is similarly invalidating of their formative experience, which provides context for their current mental state, beliefs and behavior. Okay, so let me uh, stop sharing the screen now because uh, that's pretty much the end. So what I've tried to cover is that um, psychotherapy, and psychoanalysis in and all the many different forms of psychotherapy can often uh, be extremely helpful to people. But at the same time, they have the capacity to be uh, unhelpful or even harmful. Um, now, uh, some of what I've said, maybe a lot of what I've said, um, may be mistaken, may be an error. It may be just uh, foolish perceptions on my part. Um, that, that's quite possible. And, and I, I do mean that uh, um, absolutely sincerely. Uh, but what I hope I've done is provided some um, food for thought, prompts for thought, because um, I do think it's, it's important to look at how psychotherapy can be unhelpful or, or even harmful, as well as to uh, look at how it can be very helpful. And out of all that, always, and this is, this is what I've been trying to do for many, many years, is to keep on looking for better and better ways of uh, helping people. So uh, thank you very much for uh, watching through this. I hope it has been um, uh, interesting and perhaps uh, helpful. I hope I have not uh, uh, offended anyone too much. Uh, that was not my uh, intention. Thank you.